Our main scripture for tonight is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. My sermon title is Returning to God. It comes from that passage in Joel. Even now return to me, says the Lord. Return with all your heart, for the Lord is gracious and merciful. We read this passage every Ash Wednesday, and it speaks to me every time. When I do my own reflection, there is always some part of me that realizes that I've stepped away from God in some way, or not been fully engaged. And I need to make some recommitment to being passionately engaged in my life with Jesus. We talk about repentance at this time of year and we have to remember that repentance doesn't mean to just feel bad about something, but to turn away from, to turn away from sinfulness, to turn away from the things that mess up our lives, to turn away from selfishness, to turn away from being or feeling separated from God and to return. Even now, return to me, says the Lord, return with all your heart. So what are the ways we leave God? For me, my number one is just being busy. Even if I am busy doing what we call the Lord's work, if my business, my busyness makes me irritable or short-tempered, if it makes me not have time for people, if it interferes with my time spent quietly in prayer, then I need to turn away from that behavior. And honestly, it is an ongoing battle. But the scripture, Psalm 51, is thought to have come from someone who did far worse things. Psalm 51 is thought to have been written by David. Remember, he was the one who um, had an affair with Bathsheba, and then he had her husband, Uriah, killed. The psalm has three main parts, confession, repentance, and forgiveness. In the psalm, David says first, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You can hear David's sorrow in these words. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. 
I think in life, sometimes knowing our transgressions is the hardest part, acknowledging them, being honest with ourselves about them. Sometimes we don't see the damage that we do to other people with our behavior. But for me, sometimes it's seeing the damage, seeing the reaction, the hurt. That's what makes me realize I have transgressed. You desire truth in the inward being, David says. And it is absolutely true that if we can't see our transgressions and acknowledge them, then we can't repent. And then we lose out on the gift of forgiveness. And that gift is the clean heart, that new and right spirit, the joy of salvation. And David says that when he receives that gift, when he is forgiven and restored, then he will tell everybody, he will teach transgressors about this incredible gift of forgiveness. And when his lips open, his mouth will declare God's praise. But then there is what to me is sort of a tagline, an addition, an afterthought, the moral of the tale. And I think this is my cat's favorite part, apparently. The words are, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. And contrary to making a ritual sacrifice of some kind, which is an outside action, What's being asked is inward reflection. It's about what is in our hearts. It's about examining our relationship with God. I love the intensity of Lent. I love the focus on reflection so that we have a fresh start. We return to God and it's almost like we return home. It's a journey that gives us peace, even if it takes a while to get there. These last two years have had an intensity like Lent. I remember two years ago, Blair saying the Lentiest of Lents. There's been more quiet time in these two years and times when I was with a loved one that felt like such a gift. I don't think I have ever taken my family for granted, but in these two years when I have been with them, I have cherished the time, I have treasured it. And there has been something about that which is so special. And I don't take worship for granted. I don't take for granted hearing the organ or hearing Eric sing. I don't take for granted the soft conversation as people enter the sanctuary and greet each other. On Sunday, I received and gave several hugs and I don't know if we are, if we are supposed to do that yet, but how could I not hug Charlene when we spoke about Valerie? And several of you felt like you needed to give me a hug because of what I said about my grief and sorrow about Ukraine. Or with another dear friend, there was an exchange because some words had gone between us. And with Bill's service added in, it was an emotional weekend. But there is something very special about all those connections, the fellowship, the shared sorrow, and the shared joy. And for this service, I really wanted to see your faces without your masks. And even though that we could argue that a sticker or no ashes at all is not the correct ritual for Ash Wednesday, I still feel this is sacred ground because of the community, the fellowship, and that God is present with us. And just as the end of our Psalm focused on the reflection of the heart and not the ritual act, so too, tonight, we stay focused on what is in our hearts. So we begin together the season of Lent, a time of preparation, a time of prayer, a time of reflection. This is the journey to Jerusalem that takes us all the way to the cross and to the empty tomb. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In the letter that I sent out with the sticker, I included the, the prayer for Ash Wednesday, and I'd like to have us say that together. O oh God, 
maker of everything and judge of all that you have made. From the dust of the earth, you have formed us. And from the dust of death, you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.